time has come for us to begin our Sunday school lesson. Let us pray. God, my Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us another chance to come together and study your word, to learn from your word, and to uh, teach your word. We pray, dear Lord, as we begin our lesson, that you'll open up our hearts and our minds, that we may have a better understanding of your word, and that we may be obedient to your word. This is my prayer, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Today we begin our spring quarter. It's all about the proclamation of the gospel. The gospel, sometimes referred to as the good news, is the birth, death, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our lesson title is Paul Desire to Visit Rome. And our text will be coming from Rome, the first chapter, we will begin at verse 8, and we're going to end at verse 17. And our golden text is found in the 16th verse. Paul, formerly Saul, the persecutor of Christian, is the author of this letter to the Romans. The Apostle Paul was intelligent, articulate, and committed to his calling. His calling was to witness to the world as a missionary. All of us that are selected or chosen by Christ, he also gives a calling. Like a skilled lawyer, Paul presents the case for the gospel clearly and forthrightly in his letter to the church at Rome. He's sending it to the congregation of believers in Rome with the hope that he would follow the letter personally before very long. Paul had heard of the church at Rome, but he had never been there nor had any of the other apostles. The church was begun by Jews who had come to faith during Pentecost. They spread the faith on their return to Rome and the church grew. Paul felt a bond with these Romans. They were his brothers and sisters in Christ and he longed to see them face to face. He had never met most of the Christians in Rome, yet he loved them. Isn't that a novel idea, to love someone that you don't even know? He sent this letter to introduce himself and to make a clear declaration of the faith. The foundation of the Christian faith was that all men are sinful, that Christ died to forgive sin. We are made right with God through faith. This begins a new life with a new relationship with God. If you look at verse 8, it's Romans 1st chapter, verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all, for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Paul, a devout Jew, who had first persecuted the Christians, became a believer. And you know that once you become a believer, you look at things different. You see things through a different light or prison. God used him to spread the gospel throughout the world. No person apart from Jesus himself shaped the history of Christianity like the Apostle Paul. Even before he was a believer, his action was significant. His friend's persecution of Christian following Stephen's death got the church started in obeying Christ's final command to take the gospel worldwide. Paul's personal encounter with Jesus changed his life. Paul humbly calls himself a slave to Jesus Christ. For a Roman citizen like Paul, to choose to be a slave was unthinkable. But Paul chose to be completely dependent on and obedient to his beloved master. Paul used the phrase, I thank God through Jesus Christ, to emphasize the point that Christ is the one and only mediator between God and man. Through Christ, God sent his blessing to us. And through Christ, we send our thanks to God. The Roman Christian reputation was very excellent. Their strong faith was making itself known around the world. In spite that believers were viewed as a threat to Rome and suffered intense persecution at the hands of the Roman government. 
Verse number nine says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Paul showed his warm attitude towards the Roman church by expressing God's love for, for them and his own thanks and prayers for them. To have an effect on people's lives, you need to love them and believe in them. Paul's passion to teach those people had, and have a fellowship with them began with his love for them. You can't teach anybody uh, without having some kind of love for them. And this is what the Christian journey is all about, having love for everybody, no matter whether you know them or not. Calling on God as his witness in this regard indicate that Paul was not just mouthing pious platitudes. He actually spent time in prayer on their behalf. If people request our prayers, or if we say that we will be praying for them, we need to follow through and actually do it. In verse 10, he says, make and request, if by any means now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. In Paul's prayers, he petitioned the Lord about the possibility of a visit to Rome. It was God's will for Paul to travel to Rome, but he would not get there in comfort or in his own schedule. When you pray continuously about a concern, don't be surprised how God answers. Paul prayed to visit Rome so he could teach the Christians there. When he finally arrived in Rome, it was as a prisoner. Paul prayed for a safe trip, and he did arrive safely. After getting arrested, slapped in the face, shipwrecked, and bitten by a poisonous snake, God's ways of answering our prayers are often far from what we expect. In verse 11, he says, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gifts, gift to the end, he may be established. Paul is in the prime years of his ministry, and he is able to present the fruit of his personal familiarity with bringing people to Christ and providing an atmosphere for their growth. Paul prayed for the chance to visit these Christians so he could encourage them and be encouraged by them. The Christian life was never intended to be a solo. It is designed to be lived with and for others. Paul also wanted to impart some spiritual gifts so that they could be made strong. Such gifts are usually understood as special endowment given by the Holy Spirit to believers. Since apostles could pass these gifts on to others, some see Paul's word as a promise that he would also do that when he arrived. Verse 12 and 13, that is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I propose to, do, to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among the Gentiles. As God missionary, Paul could help them understand the meaning of the good news about Jesus. As God's holy people, they could offer him fellowship and comfort. Each of them could be a blessing to the other. Paul did not want them to be uninformed. He wanted to make sure they had understood that he had planned to come many times, but was prevented. He wanted to come and work among them and see some good results just as he had in many of the other Gentile churches. Verse number 14 say, I am Datcha, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. After Paul experienced with Christ on the Damascus road, his whole life was consumed with spreading the good news of salvation. His debt was to Christ for being his savior and it was payable to the entire world. He paid his debt by proclaiming Christ's salvation to all people. 
both the Jews and the Gentiles, across all cultures, all social, racial, and economic lines. We owe Christ the same debt because he took on the punishment we deserve for our own sin. Verse number 15, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. When Paul said he was ready to preach the gospel in Rome, he was eager to do so to the fullest extent of his ability. In spite of all he went through, he was not discouraged. He had no reluctance in sharing the good news with any and all who would listen and even those that didn't listen. Are we ready to do, to do that today? To spread the good news? To tell everybody about Jesus and how he had went to the cross and died and was resurrected? A lot of us um, don't like to We'll be willing to talk about it inside these four walls, but once we get outside, we somehow seem to be embarrassed or ashamed, or uh, we're afraid of somebody might call us some re religious nuts. So we sort of stay to ourselves and don't spread the word. But it is our responsibility as a Christian to make sure that everybody hear this word. God wants everybody to be saved, and as Christians, we also should want that. Question number 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God into salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jews first and also to the Greek. In this verse is one of the most familiar statements in all of the letters Paul wrote. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Having no shame in the gospel implies that one will stand up for and promote its truth at every opportunity. It's a statement that is important for us to affirm to ourselves, to our family in Christ, and to our neighbors who are in need of the good news. Paul was not ashamed because his message was good news. It was powerful, it was for everyone, and it was, part of, it was a part of God's revealed plan a method of bringing all believers to heaven. This message was first preached to the Jews alone. They had been God's special people for more than a thousand years, ever since God chose Abraham and promised great blessing to his descendants. God did not choose them because they deserved to be, but because he wanted to bless them, to teach them, and prepare them to welcome his Messiah into the world. He chose them not to play favorites, but to tell the world about his claim for salvation. And our last verse, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed, from faith to faith, as it is written, the just should live by faith. Now there are two main ways the word righteousness is used in scriptures. Sometimes it means moral uprightness and can refer to either God or man. It is also used to reflect the status of a relationship, that is, being right with God. According to our study guide, the righteousness of God in Rome is God's saving activity directed towards sinners. The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. That is why the gospel is such a crucial message. The gospel tells sinful people how to become right with God. That is something that we can never earn or achieve through our own effort. The prophet Isaiah in 64 chapter in the sixth verse says that all our righteousness are as filthy rags before God. Our only hope is to be accepted by faith the gift of God's righteousness provided by him through the death of Jesus. In 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter and the 21st verse, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and I'm reading from the Living Bible, it says, For God took sinless Christ and poured into him our sins. Then in exchange, he poured God's goodness into us. Faith must govern our approach to God throughout our walk with him. 
we can never outgrow our need for faith. And God never changed that requirement. That's the end of our lesson for the day. Let us pray. Thank you, dear Lord, for providing a solution for our sin problem. Thank you for the good news, for no one could have provided an answer to our sin. It is in Jesus' name, our perfect Redeemer, I pray. Amen.